Hey everyone, this is Biology 160, Fall 2018, Chapter 11, Screencast for Christina Howard's Biology 160 class. So let me just get my epic pen, wake up. There we go. All right, and let's get started. So this is the last PowerPoint and therefore the last screencast um, in the series, except I'm gonna make the meiosis one as well. Uh, I am just under a mountain of grading, so I'm trying to fit all this in over my weekend. So bear with me. Okay, however, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. So I'm very excited to make this screencast for you because I am an avid naturalist. Um, I like to go bird watching. I like to catch uh, amphibians and reptiles. I just like being in nature. Um, and I wouldn't like it as much if it was homogenous. So if there was all, you know, one kind of thing, that would be really boring. So the diversity of life on our planet is really amazing and it's good for people's mental health. So let's talk about evolution, which is how that biodiversity came about in the first place. So why do we have millions and millions of different species of life forms? And, you know, millions is actually an understatement. Billions is more appropriate. Um, on our planet? Well, the answer to that is evolution. So evolution is the scientific explanation for how so much biodiversity ended up on our planet. So it doesn't include unscientific uh, thoughts on the matter. Those are an issue for another class. So we're going to focus on the way science understands life on Earth. So as you can see from this picture, here we have a sampling of a bunch of different plants and animals that we have for our enjoyment to look at, including tigers, monitor lizards, fungi, butterfly fish. Actually, I think that's a trigger fish. They have a little spine right before their tail. Here's a lorikeet. Here's a sensitive plant, box elder bug, forest, and echinacea. So I want to make a point about biodiversity, so why you should care about it. Yeah, you know, Having lots of animals to look at, that's real cool. The other thing that we as a species benefit from, from having biodiversity, is that uh, plants and fungi especially are a continuing source of a lot of useful pharmaceutical drugs that save people's lives. So we get medicines from these things. So preserving biodiversity doesn't only have um, emotional value, but also survivorship value. So the more biodiversity we're able to preserve on our planet, the more sources we will have uh, for novel medications that can solve health problems the world over. All right, so let's move on. Evolution is explained through two major overarching topics, and those are common descent with modification, so common descent means shared common ancestry. Another way to say that is that different species are related to each other via sharing some common ancestor. And even if you're not an evolutionary or phylogeny expert, you can kind of observe ju this just by thinking about animals, right? So if I give you three animals and I ask you to tell me which two are more similar to each other, you'll be able to do that just by kind of thinking about how they look, right? So if I give you a choice between a dog, a water buffalo, and a camel, you would probably tell me that the camel and the water buffalo are more similar to each other because they both eat grass, they have similar structures, forelegs, hooves, etc. And you would be right. So they are distantly related in a family, or not a family, in a group of organisms uh, called ruminants, things that chew on cud. So you can even observe common descent just in everyday creatures, but with modification. So the modification comes ultimately from mutation and adaptations that result from it. Now, mutation and adaptation create a situation where some individuals are going to survive and reproduce better than others, 
and that is natural selection. So natural selection acts on the outcomes of modification, and that creates a scenario where there is differential survivorship and reproductive success, which is what natural selection is all about. So who had this idea? Well, really two guys at the same time. So Charles Darwin is the most famous for it, but at the same time as he was publishing his work, he was also exchanging letters with another person who was thinking about this stuff. And that guy's name was Alfred Russell Wallace. So both of these uh, people are credited with the discovery, but Dar Darwin published first, so he got most of the credit, at least while he was alive. So he went out on a voyage on a ship called the Beagle. It's a cute name for a ship, in my opinion. And he was gone for a long time. He was gone for five years. So this may seem kind of crazy nowadays, but uh, at the time that Darwin was living, it wasn't uncommon for naturalists to receive grants from soci scientific societies to go on lengthy voyages. So uh, people going on long sea voyages was not actually that unusual at the time. So they stopped in a lot of places in South America and elsewhere, but one of the most significant stops was the Galapagos. And that's because uh, these are a series of islands that are really hard to get to, at least at the time you needed a ship. Um, and they're pretty spare. So in some of them, there's not a lot of plant life going on and the rains are very sporadic. Uh, so it's a very specific environment. And even though that uh, environment was relatively homogenous compared to say the rainforest, the finches that inhabited the island uh, were shockingly varietous, so they had a lot of different kinds of them. And Darwin noticed that the finches were morphologically different from each other in different habitats, but they were also specifically adapted to the habitat they were living in. So I'll give you an example of that in the next slide. Okay, so here we have Darwin's finches. And these are just a handful of the total. So in another slide, this one, you'll see some more of them. Um, but the most sort of striking feature of these, and this is what caught Darwin's eye, was that their beaks are shaped specifically for what it is that they eat. So my personal favorite, um, this guy, Geospiza magnorostris. Magna means big and rostrum is the front part of your head or nose. So uh, Geospiza magnorostris is named after its big, deep beak. And these guys have incredible crushing power at their beaks. So the reason their beak is shaped like this is because they are able to crush and open a kind of seed called a caltrop. I'll spell that for you. which is a large, exceedingly hard, and also very spiky seed, but they can open them. And at certain times of year, uh, there's not really any other seeds around. So that's uh, a great adaptation for them to be able to feed even when other finches might be having a difficult time eating. Um, and you can also see there's a bunch of other kinds of beaks. So these guys have deep crushing beaks. Magnorostris has the most pronounced one, but the medium and small ground finches do too. The cactus finch has a long beak, so it's going to be able to get between cactus spines a little bit easier. Uh, the warbler finch and the woodpecker finch have probing beaks, so these are going to be eating insects. So they're going to stick their beak into a little hole in a plant and extract, hopefully, a delicious grub. And the tree finches, these have grasping beaks, and they'll also eat insects, but typically flying insects. And finally, the vegetarian tree finch, these guys eat fruit, and they have a beak that's pretty similar to that of a parrot, who also eat fruit. So these are just sort of the finches divided by their life history style, so what they eat and how they eat it. But you can also divide them like this, and in fact, this is, you know, the more accepted version because this is called a phylogenetic tree. So let me write that down. Okay, so a phylogenetic tree basically shows you uh, relatedness among and between organisms. And, uh, Initially, these trees were constructed by observing morphology, so what organisms looked like. But now, uh, with techniques including but not limited to blast searches, remember you guys did a blast search in 
uh, lab module eight. Um, if you can take DNA from an organism, you can compare it with the DNA of similar organisms and see how close or far they are related to each other. So that's how you construct this. So the ground finches are genus Geospiza. The tree finches are Camarynchus. And the warbler finches are Certhidia. So they have some common ancestor that probably flew over to the Galapagos from the South American mainland, or perhaps was blown there by a storm. So sometimes a bird that wouldn't be able to, on its own power, fly to a distant place uh, is instead sort of forced over there by gale force winds. So not really clear how exactly the first colonizer finch arrived, but it did at some point. And from there they specialized. So um, in order not to compete with each other, some finches uh, evolved to eat insects. And that means that they're not going to compete with bud eaters. So that's called a uh, niche partitioning. And that's a fancy way of saying that if you are a member of a population and you're struggling to find food um, and you're competing with other individuals for the food, maybe you would benefit from picking a different food to eat. And over time, allele frequencies will shift uh, and create two new species, one that now just eats buds and the other that now just eats insects. So it's a way to avoid competing for resources, which is very, very important in natural selection and in evolution. So among the ground finches, we've got seed eaters, including my home bee, G. magnorostris, but also cactus flower eaters. Remember, these are going to have long beaks so they can get between cactus spines to get those sweet flowers. So as you can see, they're all related from a common ancestor, but uh, in an effort to not compete for food, they have specialized considerably. And this really, really blew Darwin away. So that was just the finch tree of life, but you can do this for the entirety of life itself. So every piece of life on Earth is ultimately descended from some ancestral protist, and some protists stayed protists and ended up being prokaryotes, and some specialized and became multicellular and as complex as, say, a great white shark or a toad or a scorpion. All right, so evolution's two key principles. I already explained these a little bit, but now that you've seen some examples, let's talk about them again. Common descent with modification means organisms on Earth can trace their lineage back to common ancestors, and populations change very slowly over time um, in response to selection pressures usually. Much later, Darwin realized that the mechanism of this process is natural selection. So let's talk about natural selection. It is basically the survival of the fittest. So fit doesn't mean a really buff animal, but rather the individuals that are the best adapted to their particular environment. So examples of that include if it's snowy half the year, maybe you evolve to turn white when it gets colder out and that helps you to hide in the snow. Uh, an individual that can do that is going to be more fit to their environment than an individual that remains brown all winter and therefore very visible to predators. So animals that are better fitted to their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. And these are linked here because the longer you survive, the more mating seasons you will see and participate in. So for most animals, uh, usually breeding is, is somewhat seasonal. And so surviving a longer time means you can rack up more breeding seasons worth of experience and more offspring. So favorable traits are passed down to the next generation while unfavorable ones are less likely to be passed along because they don't confer an advantage. So over time, this can lead to significant changes within a species. Um, but the time scales do vary. So sometimes microevolution happens pretty quickly, whereas macroevolution takes a much longer time. So we'll examine some of those examples as well. Okay, so in an effort to give credit where credit is due, Alfred Russell Wallace gets his own slide briefly. So I mentioned him earlier just because I want to honor his legacy, but here's a picture of him. Obviously a learned and scholarly man. 
Um, and his papers were read at the same time as Darwin's uh, in front of the Linnaean Society of London. Uh, so Carlos Linnaeus. Uh, was a prominent Swedish scientist and the first taxonomist. So he was uh, one of the first people that were like, hey, uh, some animals are similar and some animals are different. Maybe we should try and sort them. So that's uh, the impetus for Carlos Linnaeus's work and why the society is called the Linnaean Society. So all of these were uh, rich dude scientists that were especially interested in why we have all the kinds of animals that we have. So Darwin ended up publishing first, and he published On the Origin of Species, which is uh, a great read. It's part uh, scientific text and part adventure uh, biography. It's pretty cool. So this was a really, really hot item when it came out. Everybody wanted to get their hands on it. Um, and so he is recognized as the father of evolution, mostly because he published first. Okay, so what is evolution? It arises from three conditions. Um, evolution by itself just means change over time. So we'll look at some evidence for evolution in a little bit, but uh, how does it come about? Well, first criteria that must be met is that individuals within a species vary. So if no variation, no evolution. Some of those variations are heritable. So changes can happen that are not transmissible to subsequent generations. Uh, so we call variations that are transmissible heritable, mean, meaning that offspring can inherit them from their parents. Thus, individuals with advantageous variations will be more likely to survive and have higher reproductive rates than those with lesser traits. So adaptation is favored. And assuming those adaptation traits are heritable, they'll be passed on to offspring in a greater proportion. So, uh, for example, let's say that there's a population of bugs and seasonally they run out of food, but one batch of baby bugs is born that can tolerate and eat a plant that is poisonous or mildly poisonous to the rest of the bug population. So during that brief bug famine, those bugs are going to survive and reproduce better because they are able to use a plant for food that their brethren cannot. And that could lead to genetic population change over time, such that eventually all of the bugs in the population might be able to eat that particular plant. Okay, so the first step in evolution is called microevolution, and this just refers to small changes that accumulate in a population. Um, typically happens in shorter time periods, and that's convenient for scientists because that means that we can observe it. Um, so it doesn't take multiple lifetimes of organisms. So microevolution is often studied in organisms with a short generation time. because that means that humans can observe the microevolution easier. Okay, so microevolution is the first step of evolution, and this is just a change in allele frequencies in a population from one generation to the next. Oopsie, I wanted to move my epic pen, not open a notifications pane. There we go. Okay, so, an allele is a different version of a gene, and you, you guys have all done Punnett squares by now, so you know this. So one example is peppered moths in England. So these are a kind of moth that is designed to blend in with birch trees. Birch trees are white. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, I bumped my mic a little bit when I was trying to scratch my nose. Uh, birch trees are white with black specks on their bark. And so you can imagine that this moth would blend in with that tree pretty well, right? So darker moths were not favored because they show up more on birch trees and are not as able to blend in and therefore would suffer from predation from birds at higher rates. That was pre-Industrial Revolution, however. So during the Industrial Revolution, uh, factories that burned coal became immensely popular. And so there was just coal dust everywhere. It was in the atmosphere, it coated buildings, and it coated trees. 
So post-industrial revolution, trees got darker. Which means that moths that look like this were way more visible on those trees than they used to be. And that means that birds can see them, and that means that they're going to survive and reproduce at a lower rate than moths who are darker. And people noticed this. They were like, golly, the moths are changing. That's weird. They're changing to match their environment. So that's what's going on with these moths. So let's uh, imagine a scenario in which, there we go, let's say... Capital P equals peppered. So this one. And lowercase p equals dark. And let's just say for the sake of argument that this one is dominant, completely dominant. So not intermediate phenotype, but uh, if you have one copy, you are maximally. Actually, you know what? No, I changed my mind. It's an important thing to be able to do, change your mind on the fly. So I'm actually going to make this an incomplete dominant scenario. Um, and let's do a Punnett square with two heterozygous moths. So two intermediate phenotype moths are going to mate. All right, so we can see our classic one to two to one genotypic ratio. So one homozygous dominant to two heterozygotes to one homozygous recessive. So we're also going to have one light moth, two medium gray moths, and one black. Moth. Both. Moth. My hand decided to do something different than what my, my mouth was saying. That was odd. All right, so one black moth. Um, and let's say in pre-industrial revolution England, uh, this individual would probably get eaten sooner than his brothers. But as the trees darkened, even though this is a purely recessive uh, allele, and there's a one in four chance of having that kind of offspring, uh, if there's an increase in survivorship among these individuals, then you're going to have more little p, little p in the population, which means that that allele is going to persist because it used to be a disadvantage, but now and it's, and it's an advantage. So that's kind of the idea behind that. All right, so after microevolution takes hold, Macroevolution tends to take more time, so given enough time and enough change. Um, so macroevolution is the formation of new species, so we also call it speciation, which is written down here. Um, the criteria for speciation is that individuals can no longer successfully interbreed with members of the original species or with each other. So in California, we have salamanders, and as parts of this ancestral population moved on either side of the mountain range. My Californian geography isn't great. I think these are the Sierra Nevadas. Um, my brother would be ashamed of me. He's an avid geologist. Anyway, so on this side of mountains that I think are the Sierra Nevadas, uh, it's drier because the sea is over here, not over here. So these organisms that are moving down this way are facing different selection pressures from these little guys that are moving down this way. So over evolutionary timescales, when they get to the end of the Sierra Nevadas and they meet back up, the populations can no longer successfully mate. So um, I want to be mindful of defining successful interbreeding. So mate and produce viable offspring. So viable offspring means offspring that live, but also offspring that are capable of reproducing themselves. So hybridizations do occur.
but typically they result in animals that are sterile and not able to reproduce on their own. So yes, they will live, but they won't be able to make babies. All right, so um, that's the sort of mechanism of macroevolution. So in this case, uh, these two halves of the population were separated by a large geological feature, but uh, it can happen other ways as well. Alrighty, so there's five major forces that drive macroevolution and microevolution, um, and these are them. So we're going to talk about each of these in turn. The first one is mutation. And remember, mutation includes things like base substitutions, which is a kind of point mutation. Anything that changes the genetic code of an animal in a way that changes its phenotype is going to be capable of being acted on by natural selection. Um, natural selection, of course, is also at play here, as is genetic drift, gene flow, and non-random mating. So we're going to go through all of these one by one. Okay, mutation. So this is the only way that completely new genetic material can come about. So uh, you might be wondering, well, what about independent assortment? Or what about um, crossing over? Doesn't that make new genetic material? No, it just rearranges existing genetic material. So I'm going to write that down up here because it's important. So those two things don't actually create new genes or alleles. They just rearrange ones that are pre-existing. So mutations can have three possible outcomes. One is the trait is that is new is beneficial. One is that the new trait is detrimental, so uh, negative for survival. And this one would be plus survival. Or it has no effect at all. So let's say you change uh, the DNA such that the resulting mRNA has a codon change, but it is, let's say, CCC. Oops. And then the C is changed to, or excuse me, not that C. This C is changed to CCA still proline. So even though a mutation has occurred, there's no difference in the outcome. So that's an example of a silent mutation. It doesn't do anything. Either of the first two, so let's asterisk those, can pr alter the process of evolution by determining an individual's reproductive success. And mutations can also be hereditary, which means that they can be passed on to the next generation. All right, natural selection. So this happens all the time and natural selection acts on mutations. So when a new allele arises in a population, uh, depending on what change it results in, it's either going to help or harm an, or an organism uh, relative to its environment. So take down here, we have some early giraffes. This is tall giraffe. And here we have two shorter giraffes. If trees are being stripped, that means that this giraffe, once it's finished any leaves that are coming off of this part of the, the trunk, it's not going to have any more food because it can't reach, but tall giraffes sure can. So in this environment, with trees that have long, tall trunks and foliage at the top, um, there's going to be positive selection for being taller and having a longer neck. And unfortunately, shorter giraffes don't make it. So this is talking about individuals who are well adapted, and there should be a hyphen here, uh, to their current environment. So have uh, physical attributes that allow them to use and live in their environment um, more effectively and with better survivorship and reproductive success. So that's the idea behind that.
All right, genetic drift. So this is a phenomenon where sometimes allele frequencies shift for no reason. So imagine an allele that uh, codes for some trait, like let's say shell color in bugs. And it's not the case that being green or tan uh, is better or worse for this population, but rather maybe all the green bugs, except for one of them, get smushed uh, by a postal carrier. And so for no reason at all, other than somebody not watching where they're walking, uh, all but one of the green bugs in that population disappear. That doesn't mean that being green is less advantageous, it just means that random chance had that effect on the population. So um, because of how this works, this typically has a stronger effect on smaller populations because um, smaller populations are more greatly affected by large chance events. Oops. Gene flow is another possibility. So sometimes there's two populations of individuals of the same species. Um, and maybe, okay, so here we have an organism with a short generation time. So it's easy to observe microevolution in them um, if it occurs. However, let's say that these bugs are the same species. But in that species, these bugs live in the desert. That's why they're tan, so they can blend in. And green bugs live in forested areas. So that's why they're green, so they can blend in with chlorophyll. <coughs> Excuse me. So same species, different populations. And, you know, bugs can fly. So these are little uh, beetles that are capable of flying. So maybe uh, the forest sort of runs out and becomes desert at some point, and there's populations that are intermediate, such that you can get uh, migration or emigration to or from another population. So maybe this tan bug is like, I'm out of here. He's tired of life in the desert. He's tired of being eaten by roadrunners. He wants to go to the forest. And so he arrives at the forested area, and he can bring his tan shell allele into this population of green bugs. So now, assuming that these green bugs recognize him as a potential mate and will mate with him, now this population has a new allele that it didn't before. Now it has tan shell allele. Okay, so another one is non-random mating. And this is also called sexual selection. So here's the deal with this. And this is, in my opinion, the most interesting facet of evolution. So not all individuals in a population have the same success in mating. So certain males or females tend to mate more frequently, and this means that more of their genes are passed to the next generation. So mate choice is an important aspect of this because that differential reproductive success is pretty much universally determined not by access to mates, but by mate preference. So if you are a male peacock, uh, how much you get to mate is going to determine how effective you are at displaying your fancy tail to female peacocks. So this causes the development of traits that are beneficial for mating, so big fancy tail, for example. Behold, the majesty. And then maybe this female is like, yeah, I love that tail. Let's make baby peacocks. Or maybe this bird is like, check out my cool feathers, look how well I dance. And this bird is like, meh, seen better. So mate choice is pretty important. And it's also important to note that the preference of the opposite sex for a particular trait, like female peacock preference for this kind of tail, um, it might be random. So it might just be the case that an early male peacock had a slightly longer tail and for whatever reason uh, female peacocks were like hey that's pretty cool i like that tail kind and so that trait was preserved as was the preference for a longer tail um, so these sexually selected traits uh, tend to be coupled with a preference 
for that trait in the opposite sex, and therefore uh, both the trait and the preference for the trait are passed along evolutionarily. It's very interesting. Okay, so let's look at some evidence for evolution now. Um, going back to early concepts, remember a theory is not the same thing as a hypothesis. So a theory is a larger overarching uh, truth about the way the natural world works that is supported by many, many hypotheses, right? So lots and lots of evidence to back up theories and lots of very diverse evidence in this case. So evolution is a big field. So the support for it doesn't only come from one taxon, it comes from research in tons of life forms, virtually all of the ones that exist. So we're gonna look at four lines of evidence. There are many others, but these are the kind of easiest ones to take a small bite out of for this uh, 100 level class. So one is the fossil record and people have been discovering fossils for a long time. So uh, it used to be that people would, you know, be out gardening or plowing their fields or what have you, or trying to construct a building and they would stumble upon a fossil and say, gosh, that doesn't look like anything that's alive today. How interesting. I wonder if that used to be a thing. So fossils are handy because they can show the evolutionary progression of species over millions and millions of years. So an example that's shown here is uh, evolution on the way to modern horses. And this happens to be well, pretty well preserved in North America, mainly because uh, in early America, horses or pre-horses like Eohippus tended to run around and die in prairies or marshlands or alluvial plains. So places where that seasonally flood um, and places like that tend to be good places for fossil formation because sedimentary rock is a good rock for forming fossils. So the older the rock formations are, the more primitive the fossils become. So Eohippus kind of looks horsey, but it also looks a little bit dog-like. But as you approach present day, you see that things get horsier as time goes on. And this is actually the Przewalski's horse. So this is the uh, horse from which all breeds of horses are ultimately derived. So um, horse breeds are not a result of evolution, but rather uh, artificial selection by humans. So groups of people favored particular horsey traits and bred horses with those traits together to preserve the traits. Comparative anatomy is another example. So many organisms have internal structures that share the same form despite having different appearance or function. So for example, this is the flipper of a whale. And of these, so we have human, we have dog, and we have bird. These two resemble each other more strongly than these two or these two. So that is called homology. which means similarity of structure. Oh, I accidentally used the... Uh... There we go. Alrighty, so <clears throat> the reason for homology among species is because of common ancestry. So we can tell that we share common ancestors uh, with dogs, birds, and whales because the way our forearms are built is extremely similar. So there's structures that are conserved across taxa. So for a, for a trait to be conserved means that it persists in a recognizable form over evolutionary timescales. All right, adaptation. This is also called convergent evolution. Um, so what this means is that environments have the power to cause traits to evolve similarly in different organisms. So it's not the case that the Arctic ptarmigan and the fox have uh, a, a recent common ancestor. They do not. This one is, let's see, here we go, class aves. So birds and this little guy, isn't he cute, is class mammalia. So recent common ancestor, not recent at all. Millions and millions and millions of years ago. 
So why are they both white during the winter and brown during the summer? Well, in the tundra, where they live, it's white for half to three-fourths of the year. And it's brown and green for the remainder. So being a brown critter on a white background is bad. If you're a ptarmigan, it means that you are at higher risk for being eaten. And if you are an arctic fox, it means that your potential prey, the ptarmigan, can see you. So um, although these creatures are not related to each other at all, uh, they both have temporary white coverings during winter in order to camouflage. But camouflage for different purposes. So fox is camouflaging to hide from prey. Ptarmigan is camouflaging to hide from predators. So different evolutionary pressures, different organisms, same adaptation. And that's because of the environment they live in. All right, biogeography. So biogeography refers to observations about where particular kinds of animals are found and where they used to be found. So um, long, long, long time ago, the earth didn't look like this. Meh. It looked like this. So we had large aggregates of continents that combined to form supercontinents like Gondwana and like Pangaea. And this meant that gene flow could happen this way, or for example, this way, or maybe over here. So uh, populations had a lot more opportunity to overlap. As the continents spread apart, giving us this scenario, now this used to touch this landmass doesn't anymore. So now we can't have emigration of species from here to here, at least not by walking. Um, so of course, migratory birds are able to span distances like this, but uh, the distance really is significant for evolution. So broad groups that evolved before the breakup of the supercontinent Mammals, for example, reptiles, amphibians, just to name a few, there are many others, um, are distributed worldwide. So you see mammals everywhere. So let's play a game. Let's just put an M everywhere you can find mammals. M. 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 M, M. Lots of mammals all over the place. And let's just draw a big A over this because birds go wherever the birds want to go. They have the power of flight. Lucky them. We also have, let's do R for reptiles. Reptiles, reptiles, reptiles. Yes, even in Northern Europe, there are reptiles. Uh, my friend Anna is Swedish. And she said, we have two kinds of snakes. And one of them is just called bite snake because that's the one in Sweden that bites. Uh, that would be the European asp. Um, there's, yeah, so there's two kinds of snakes in Sweden. One is poisonous, one is not. Um, regardless, there are reptiles there. And there are reptiles here and here and lots down here and lots here too. In fact, this one has reptiles that are very, very dangerous. Um, no reptiles here that we know of. So you can see from the distribution of large groups of animals that, uh, that supports the idea that the continents used to be one conglomerate, right? Um, and then groups that have evolved since the breakup have differentiated from each other. So a great example of this, although not the only one, not even by far, is the fact that as far as the mammals that live in Australia go, they are all marsupials. So they are animals that have pouches and give birth to young who are not completely formed and then have to uh, live in a pouch. Um, and also monotremes, which are egg-laying mammals. You'll see one. Oh wait, no, that was on the uh, website. Never mind. So uh, things like echidnas and platypus. These are monotremes. So um, after Australia, broke off and exited the supercontinent, 
the mammals that lived on that giant land raft began to specialize, and specifically, they did so by becoming marsupials. And that's why marsupial diversity is so much greater in Australia than it is anywhere else. Like, yeah, we do have marsupials, um, like opossums in North America, but uh, nowhere in the earth is there more marsupial diversity than here. Alrighty, so that is the end of the slideshow. So thank you for your attention. I'm going to go ahead and post this now, um, and I will see you all at the final this coming week.